Blue Goblin, the greatest goblin that ever lived, is back. Uh, I apologize for being gone so long. I want to apologize to all my followers and uh, especially to uh, everybody at Dark Avenger Inc. Plus. I'm sorry I was gone so long, but I was told by many of my friends that they understood. I just had a, a family, a family loss, a big, a big loss in my family, and. You know, family came first, and um, you know these things happen. It hurts, but uh, but along the way, there was also some goodness to it. It was um, yes, we did suffer a loss, but most of the family got back together for a for an impromptu family reunion, and I really had fun with it. And we said our goodbyes, and we went on about our lives. So I want to thank you all for your patience. And I'm here to deliver a giant size review. Now, these are the books I'm going to choose to review. I'm still behind on a few books. There's a couple of annuals, a couple of Batman annuals that I still haven't got yet. So I don't know what's going on in there. I did get the Flash annual, and I'll get to that when I get to it. And I'll just... I'll just review these books and let's see if I still got it. We're going to start with DC. We're going to start off with Detective Comics number 23, The Dark Knight, Dethroned by the Wrath. Uh, wow. This was, um, this was really good. This was really good stuff. Uh, the story is progressing with, um, uh, you know, the Wrath, uh, a.k.a. E.D. Caldwell of Caldwell Technologies or Caldwell Industries or whatever the name of the company is and Bruce is still Bruce figures out a way to you know try and learn more about him you know and sometimes you have to take big risks so he's going to infiltrate him as Bruce Wayne he wants to set up another meeting learn more about this about this douchebag of a businessman and Bruce learns quite a few things. So let's just say that he learns quite a few things, and uh, the the end of the first story ends on a pretty pretty decent cliffhanger. And, uh, and all I'll say is Alfred's in deep shit. So uh, this was this was good. Now the second story involving uh, the the Man Bat. Oh man, I'm in. I'm really enjoying this Man Bat story. It's been very very well done we learn more about Francine Langstrom Dr. Kurt Langstrom's wife who is also I would call her a femme bat she's not a man bat she, you know she's not a man so I guess I would call her um, a femme bat or you know I don't know what I would call her but the bat that she derived her man bat serum from was a vampiric bat, a vampire bat. This is a this is a a bat monster that craves blood and flesh, and it's just really gruesome at times. But we learn more about Francine as a character, about what her her how her relationship with her husband Kurt really is, and uh, we learn a few things in here, and it was very very. Uh, nice twists, nice tweaks. This 
drama, the artwork was great. I loved it. This was a solid issue. One of the few titles on the shelf that I would say, yeah, it's worth your $4. This is good. This was really good. All right, moving along. All right, we got Earth 2, number 15. I gave my Earth 2 counterpart the day off, okay? So he's not going to be here, thank God. <laughs> um, that is a pretty pretty weird cover. But um, James Robinson, Nicola Scott, and Trevor Scott, uh, I give them all the credit in the world. This is still a solid series. We're learning more about these these three new characters that have showed up in the Earth 2 world. We learn more about them. We learn what they do. We learn who they are. Um, a little exposition-y during the action, but still very nicely done. A uh, pretty decent spotlight on Jay Garrick. Um, it's I I don't really know what else to say about this. I mean, this was this was decent stuff. Uh, the action here was really taken up a notch. We learn more about the uh, the main villain Steppenwolf. We learn more about him, but that's just it. We just learn about him. And uh, there's some good stuff in here from Mr. Miracle and Big Barda. It's, oh God, it's so good to see them. But, uh, you know what, maybe I, sh maybe I should spoil it. Maybe I should, because this has been out for a while, and I'm sure everybody's already been blowing this up all over the internet. But in case you haven't read this spoiler alert, BAMO! Enter the Red Tornado. And this is a really interesting twist. Uh, it looks like Red Tornado, well, this is Red Tornado Unit 1.3. It's a woman. So, not only has the uh, the Atom in the regular DC Universe here in the New 52 changed gender, but so has Red Tornado. This is a nice twist. Uh, the action here, like I said, was very, very well done. Uh, the, the artwork was great. I love the interior artwork. James Robinson did a very very good job with the writing it's just I think I would have enjoyed this better had I, I, I don't know I mean it's just it's like you bring in you bring in these characters in the last issue on a cliffhanger we don't know hardly anything about him so of course we're gonna have to use a lot of exposition in this issue to get us familiar with these new characters I don't think it really necessarily really hurts the book but it kind of drags it down just a little bit, in my opinion. But this was a still a solid read. And I really enjoyed it. All right. This is the only annual I've gotten out of the three that was on my pull list. <laughs> but you would understand why I had to hold a couple back, because they're five bucks a pop. But this is the one I wanted to get. The Flash, annual number two. Why did I want to get this one? It's because... It, this is the uh, New 52 origin of the Barry Allen Hal Jordan bromance. And I was like, okay, you got me curious. I wanted to see how this how this bromance in the New 52 got started. And I got to say, um, Brian Buscioletto, um, let me see, who does the interior artwork in here? The interior artwork is pretty damn impressive. Um... Sammy Bassery. I probably butchered that name and I'm sorry. But the interior artwork in here was actually pretty good for what it was. Um, a solid one and done issue. You know, most annuals to me nowadays don't have as much pizzazz as they used to back in the back in the old days of annuals. But for that's just my opinion. Some annuals just don't live up to the hype or the price tag sometimes. But this one I kind of feel like it did. I mean, this was a this was a long story, a, a you know a, a a big size book, so I can understand here putting the five dollar tag on it. Was this worth five dollars? That that's all up in the air. Because I'm a big flash, a big flash mark. Yeah. I, I think I, I think I got my money's worth out of this story. I really do. It wasn't perfect, but for what it was, I did enjoy it. I just I love the chemistry between uh, Barry and Hal in here. It kind of reminded me of the good old days, you know, and how they would 
you know, constantly quip each other or how they would how they would bitch and whine and bicker against each other, but at the same time they knew they're they know they're both heroes and they gotta do what they gotta do. This was this was a fun read. I did enjoy it. It was solid for what it was. Um and uh, the cover's not misleading. Barry does actually wear the ring in this issue, and to see what he does in here was pretty, pretty impressive. This was this was good. I I, I liked it. All right, next up, excuse me. Uh, Green Lantern number twenty-three, without a ring, without a chance. Robert Venditti and uh, Billy Tan. Wow. Billy Tan's artwork is just fantastic in here. Hal is trying to further adjust to his new leadership role of the, of the Green Lantern Corps, and he keeps getting pep talk after pep talk after pep talk with Kilowog. Kilowog's frustrated with his new role, too. He took Salak's old job after uh, the Wrath of the First Lantern bullshit. Uh... In here, Hal's going after the escaped prisoner now, Star Sapphire. In here, and he 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 don't do too good. <laughs> Let's just say that he, he don't do too good. This this particular Sapphire, this former uh, Oa pr prisoner of Oa, she automatically knows how to use this ring, and she knows how to use it to her advantage, and she uses it to really mind fuck Hal really bad during the fight and I'm like ooh that's just dirty that is just some dirty tactics but it makes for good drama I, I would suppose the artwork really helped sell it this was good the writing was solid I loved it <laughs> and we're also getting more uh, more into this whole rings uh, not just the Green Lantern rings but all the Lantern rings we're also getting another also getting more and more peaks at them fluttering and constantly you know powering out for a few seconds and then powering right back up still don't know why they're doing that but who knows this could really go somewhere i really enjoyed this book i think you would too i'd say i'd say this is definitely worth three bucks without question all right we're ending dc off with red lanterns number 22 for once they agree Guy Gardner must die. Um, yeah, I made quite a fuss about the last issue with Guy Gardner putting on the red ring because he, you know, he quit. He quit the. He, I mean, there's, there's, there's no exaggeration. He quit the Green Lantern Corps and voluntarily put on the red ring and became a Red Lantern. And in here, we get to see. Uh, now, now that he's got a red ring on, remember when a, when a new Red Lantern emerges, he's first like he's like just full of rage, and he's so full of rage he can't he can't function up here unless they take a dip in the the sea of blood or whatever the hell it is they call it. It basically gives them their mind back, but yet keeps their rage power intact and everything. But they're all in agreement that. They, you know, they should kill Guy Gardner because he, you know, who he, he, if he was ballsy enough to go after Atrocitus and take his ring and slap it on, it means he could be dangerous. And while they're sitting there bickering about who should kill him, uh, Rancor, the other human Red Lantern, secretly constructs a beam and dips Guy Gardner in the water and in, in, in the Blood River and pulls him back out. And Guy's like, "Hey, just want to let you know, while I was gone, all the all over." I could hear what y'all were saying about me. Yeah, and um, this is shaping up for a guy to be a pretty decent leader of the Red Lantern Corps. And the stuff that, that goes on in here was very, very well done. Uh, I'm willing to bet there's probably there's probably still a lot of people who aren't fond of this change to the Guy Gardner character. But I'm going to, you know, I think I might have judged a little too harshly on this abrupt change and how it came to be to me it still didn't make sense that he just up and quit the, the core just to join the Reds I think there might be more to it than that as the story continues to unfold I don't know I'm I'm still skeptical about where this could go 
you know, is there more to the story other than Guy just simply quitting? You know, I, I'm really anxious to see where uh, where Charles Soule can really take this book. I mean, this was this was a solid read. Uh, not the best issue of the, of the Red Lantern books, but I still think it was. I still think this series is worth your money. It's worth your time. I really think this series is slightly underrated. I know it's got a. It's, I know it's got a huge fan base, but. I just, I would like to see more and more. Pe I would like to see more and more people talk about this series because I really think it's really well done. But then again, that's just me. Hold on a second. Excuse me. All right, we're moving on to Marvel. We're starting off Marvel with all new X Men number fifteen, Jean Grey and the Beast. Uh, that cover's not false advertising. This shit happens. <laughs> um, wow. Uh, Bendis is still nailing it with his X-Men goodness in here. I think now is the right time to be a Brian Michael Bendis fan because, man, he is just killing it with his X-Men stuff. I really think he is. Um, now, Stuart Imaman takes, uh, uh, I guess he got the day off on this, but we got uh, Mr. La Fuente on the interior artwork. And for what this was, excuse me, sitting on my wallet and it's driving me crazy. All right, where was I? Yeah, uh, David La Fuente does the interior artwork in here. This book, this book starts off on a really awkward moment between. Gene and Rachel. I mean, how would you feel if you saw your how would you feel if you saw your mother as a teenage girl like either getting ready to take a shower or coming out of the shower? Uh-uh. <laughs> oh shit, that's got like that's like that's Marty McFly awkwardness, you know? Damn. But at the, I think Gene was fixing to go take a shower when Rachel approached the, the lady's sh uh, showers. And she's just like, hmm. <laughs> Used her mind powers to erase the sight of seeing her mother in a bath towel as a teenage girl. It's just hilarious. Uh, but what really sells this book, this particular issue, is the original X-Men. Uh, Scott, young Scott and young Bobby decide to go out and just go out and have a good time out in the city and young Bobby what an arrogant little prick <laughs> I mean wow <laughs> but the but how Gene finds out about young Hank here I don't want to give it away. It was such a good moment. I, I love the dialogue. It was a it was a nice moment. Decent setup. Good execution. I I, I, I love this stuff. But um, I mean, this felt more like you know a solid one and done uh, story with some with some hints as to what be, could, could be going on in other X Men stories. Because we do get a small appearance of Dazzler in here. This was this was just really a fun read. Nothing more, nothing less. It lacks on the action, but it's fun. This was fun. Had good artwork, good moments, good good emotional drama. I guess this was great. Loved it. All right, moving on. I don't know if. My opinion is going to match y'all's on this one. Captain Marvel number 14. I wasn't really feeling this because this is the, the finale of The Enemy Within that crosses between Captain Marvel and Avengers Assemble. Here's the problem. I don't get Avengers Assemble. I don't read Avengers Assemble. So there's a couple of parts of the story. I don't know what the fuck happened. Now, there was exposition in a couple of issues of Captain Marvel concerning this but for the finale I mean there's this 
there wasn't as much expo there wasn't hardly as much exposition in this one as there was in the other issue of Captain Marvel that covered this story. I mean, it's like I open this up, start reading, and I see Carol like injured, beat all to hell. She's weak. Um, Kelly Sue DeConnick, I I know you're a great writer and everything. Um, and I know you stopped talk. I know you stopped. Uh, I know you stopped answering my tweets and my questions on Tumblr, probably because I insulted your husband. I'm sorry, but I'm not gonna lie just to kiss someone else's ass. Um, the writing here was good. It was good, and the final moments of the issue was a really big whoa. However, this book does have problems. Like like me, if you only collect Captain Marvel, if you don't get Avengers Assemble, you're not going to care as much for the enemy within as probably other people did who got the whole story. Another thing in here is that the interior artwork in here was still, it is still really, really bad. I want to show you an example here. Hang on. Oh, right here. Uh, here's, a, here's a panel of Captain America. Now, in one prior issue of Captain Marvel, I showed you all a drawing of Captain America. It looks like Rob Liefeld drew him. You know, the little bitty head and the ginormous muscle, muscular arms and shit. Y'all remember that. But now, here's another... Just, oh, just look at this. If you can. Look at Captain America. God, look how much his chin sticks out. Jesus. I mean, I wonder if I, I almost wonder if I've seen better artwork in Ren and Stimpy. This was the uh, that's just a that's just one sample. I mean, the artwork in here it needs to improve. And there's a there's a picture of Carol in here. I don't know how well the light's gonna get it, but this is supposed to be a defining moment, and I can't help but laugh at her damn face. And, you know, she makes the revelations like it's Captain, you little maggot, but the way her face is drawn on this panel, she doesn't look like she's about to kick someone's ass. She looks like she caught her boyfriend cheating on her or something. Like, Ugh. It just, oh, God. The, why, can't the, why can't the cover art match the interior artwork? That's my biggest problem with the entire Captain Marvel series. Why did Dexter Soy have to leave this series? I mean, Jesus. This is a perfect example of shitty artwork ruining a series. It really is. I, Y'all know me. I'm brutally honest. I tell it like it is. But, man, don't get me wrong. The writing was good. It was solid. A decent ending to a story I didn't really know that much about. But man, the interior artwork sucks in here. It really does. And I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, Alright, next up. Daredevil, number 29. Now, I still have yet to look at my... Uh, my I got a buddy who's got you know back issues of Daredevil. I still haven't got a chance to read those yet. So, I'm still... Right now, I am still way, 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 way behind with Daredevil. I just jumped on board with issue 28, and here I am in issue 29. This is the conclusion of the story involving the, uh, the Sons of the Serpent stuff. Um, oh my god, but this was so good. It's uh, After reading this issue, I'm just going to go through, I'm just going to glance through it again just to remind myself just how good this was. I mean, after reading these two issues... I am really, really kicking myself for waiting this long to get on board with Daredevil. Mark Wade sure as hell knows what the hell he's doing in here. Uh, just wow. Just simply wow. We learn more about the individuals from the, the, the serpents who are like infiltrating this courthouse and everything. Is <laughs> It's it's espionage done very very well, great stuff. The interior artwork was great. Rodriguez just killed it with the artwork, and Mark Wade just working his magic, 
and making this an awesome series. I was now I'll admit I'm not the world's biggest Daredevil fan, but Jesus Christ, this was good. This was good. Now I understand why some people say this is one of the best titles, not just for Marvel, but one of the best comic book titles, period, running on the shelves right now. This was fantastic stuff. Had a, it was a decent ending to the story, and the I don't want to say the ending was a cliffhanger. It's just, you know, I guess it's one of those moments where you want to know what happens next, get the next issue. You know, it wasn't really a cliffhanger. It's just the this story continues next issue kind of thing. But it's one of those things where it, it's one of those endings where the main character where Matt runs in, runs across somebody. You don't know who it is. You got to wait until the next issue, which sometimes that works. We don't always need to see a big reveal of a certain character and you wait and say, wait, you want to know what they said? Tune in next issue or read the next issue, excuse me. But this one, they they did it a little differently. You know he you know he's talking to somebody, but you don't see who it is. So makes the curiosity go up a little bit more. This was solid, great read, great writing, great, great writing. This was so much fun. I loved this. I am proud that I put this on my pull list. And as soon as I get caught up, I'll probably enjoy the hell out of this even more. Mm. Don't be like me. Go ahead and jump on board with Daredevil now if you haven't done it yet. This was good. This was so good. I want to thank everybody who got me hooked on the Daredevil, especially uh, to my friends Mark and Chloe at Fast Stack of Comics. Mark, thank you. Chloe, there's a heart for you, sweetie. <laughs> Thank you. This was, um, <laughs> glad y'all talked me into Daredevil. All right, next up Fearless Defenders, number seven. I like the covers. The covers is one of the things that's my favorite thing about this series. Um,. I, I, I know a lot of people on the internet. I got a lot of friends on the internet who told me that the, after issue six, they immediately dropped the series after Annabelle died. I can understand that because her death pissed me off too. She was one of my favorite characters of the series. She was, she was something different. It's not because she was a lesbian. She was different. She was awkward. She was funny. She was clever. She was a dork. I mean, she, I, I loved everything about that character. She was such a fun joy to read. I always got a cheap laugh out of, or, you know, I, it always made me smile and laugh a little bit to see what kind of shit she was getting into in the series. And then they killed her off as if she was just cannon fodder. That's, it just, this is how I felt at the time when it happened. But, you know, after I spoke to Cullen Bunn about it, I, you know, I was like, okay, I'm going to stick with it and see where you go from this. Because if Annabelle was truly one of Mr. Bunn's favorite characters, then there had to have been a reason why he did what he did in issue six leading up to this. And once I read this, I'm thinking, Mr. Bunn, well played. Very well played played. I'm impressed. You, 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 <laughs> I apologize if I, if I came off as a bit insulting to you when we had our conversation on Twitter, but I have to say very, very well played. Not only was the writing very good, but oh my god, the interior artwork in here. Stephanie Hans, Jesus, I want to show off some of this stuff. I mean, look at some of this artwork. It's just gorgeous. Where has this artwork been? I want this. To, I want Stephanie Hans to be the the permanent artist on here. This was good. This was so good. But I'm sure everybody already knows what's going on. So I'm gonna go ahead and spoil it because everybody's talking about it. Annabelle has returned from the dead as a favor for Val from Valkyrie. Valkyrie calls in a favor and asks for Annabelle to be resurrected. However, even though that happens, it comes at a price. What's the price? 
I will show you. Annabelle Riggs, newly resurrected, is now the Valkyrie. That's right. Brunhild has chosen to sacrifice herself, sacrifice herself to resurrect Annabelle. Annabelle is now Valkyrie. Very, like I said, very well played, Mr. Bun. I'm really curious on where you could go with this. Mmm. Nice. This was nice. And I know my dear friend Samantha on Tumblr, finger fucking female fury. Samantha, my friend, sweetie, I know you love this too. So, awesome. Awesome stuff. Good job, Marvel. Good job. <sighs> Next up, Guardians of the Galaxy number five. Brian Michael Bend is still just killing it here. Just killing it. Sarah Bacelli, the interior artwork was good. I love that cover with Angela on the cover. Now, I never read Spawn. Never. Ever did. Never, never, never did. So, I didn't know that much about Angela going into this series. I didn't. But what I will say... This bitch be looking good. <laughs> nice. Love that two-page spread. I loved everything about this. I mean, this was, this was once again very, very solid read. Now, there's, there's huge, there's a huge uh, playoff of the after effects of the Age of Ultron. All that, all that time jumping that all these heroes have been doing over the years has broken the space kind of time continuum and we're seeing some effects of that in this series not just Angela but there's some shit going on with Star Lord in here that really gives a big indicator that more and more bad things are fixing to happen in here the uh, the action here was good for what we got the dialogue in here was excellent Bendis knows how to write this the character interactions with everybody was very, very well done. I, I like I like seeing Tony and Rocket you know, converse together. I mean, they're just a riot. I love it. But I'm sure y'all want me to show this off too. I mean, hell, it's been out for a while, so it's not much of a spoiler if I do this. You know what? Nah, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to spoil the ending. The ending... Star, the ending of the story is Star-Lord wants to find out more about what's going on with space-time continuum, what's going on with time. And he goes to somebody who he knows can, you know, talk to him about it. Who does he go to? Uh-uh. I'm not going to spoil it. This has been out for quite a while. But, out of fairness to people who might not have read this issue yet, I'm still not going to give it away. But all I'll say is... Damn. <laughs> Just damn. I'm going to leave it at that. Solid read. Oh, boy. Kick-Ass 3, number 2. The Big Bad. Now, I'll go ahead and say this. This issue was a hell of a lot better than issue 1, but that's not really saying that much. I mean, uh, Mark Millar... Uh, a, a good writer, very good writer. In fact, he wrote my favorite Wolverine story of all time, Old, Old Man Logan. And then you got one of my personal favorite artists, John Romita Jr. in here, so you're thinking, what could go wrong? Well, I don't know if this is like, uh, I don't know how many, I don't remember how many issues they said it was in this particular series. But so far, it's still just going very slowly to me. Um, I don't really know what else to say. I mean, you know, like I said, this was a lot better than the first issue. But still, I felt like... I just feel like this should be going... A, the pacing of the storytelling... I just think it should be going just a little bit faster than it actually is. I, I guess I'm nitpicking too much. I guess I'm expecting too much from it, because I enjoyed the first Kick-Ass. I enjoyed the second Kick-Ass. I know Sick Rick Joseph hated Kick-Ass 2, which I understand, but I thought Kick-Ass 2 was 
very controversial with some of the shit that happened in there. But, um, but this, uh, uh, we learned that uh, the former Red Mist, who I guess is still going by the motherfucker, is uh, still being protected by the by the mob, the family, and and we get some very twisted dialogue from his mother and and everything. But I just I. Don't get me wrong, it wasn't a bad, it wasn't a bad issue, I did enjoy it, I just think it could have been a little bit better, I really, really do, but I, I did like the ending, the ending was, the ending was alright, but, um, <clears throat> the only, my favorite thing about this particular issue, this was an okay issue, but my favorite thing was the teaser for the next issue. Uh, hit girl being in charge of the prison apparently which I could definitely see that happening <laughs> but hopefully issue 3 is a hell of a lot better than this because you know issue 3 I think we'll finally get some get to see some storytelling from hit uh, on hit girl uh, like I said this I, it just depends on who you are what kind of fan of comic books you are if you if you like if you love Kick Ass, if you're a hardcore fan of Kick Ass, then you might like this a lot more than I did. But it was what it was. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hope y'all are still with me. All right. Superior Spider-Man number 15. Holy shit, this was good. Dance slot still just killing it this is part one of the story called run goblin run you still got Humberto Ramos doing the interior artwork as well as the cover art here I, I like this cover now what this basically is it's called run goblin run what do you think it's about it's superior spy going after the uh, the he's not, I don't call I don't want to call him the hobgoblin because Roderick Kingsley is the Hobgoblin. This is um, uh, this is what's his name? Oh shit! <laughs> I should rehearse this shit more often. Uh, uh, Phil Urick. This is the uh, Phil Urick Hobgoblin. I I'll call him mm, Hobby Two. You know. <laughs> You know, Spidey's going against Hobby 2 here, and um, it ain't going so well for Hobby. Um, yeah, we get to learn more about what's going on with Phil in here. He is in some serious debt. Yeah, debt. And if he doesn't pay this debt... That's his ass. <laughs> uh, but, um, wow. He's going around asking for more money from everybody he's working with. You know, he even goes to the Daily Bugle and he's like, hey, I, I, need, I need another advance. I need some money. I need more money. I mean, you can really see the fear in this guy's, in this guy's dialogue. You can see the fear on his face. You know, he's... Like I said, he needs to pay off some debts, <laughs> you know, and it's just, it's just good all around stuff. But you know, we're starting. Another thing I'm noticing here is a lot more and more supporting cast members of the Spider-Man mythos, including Mary Jane, Carly Cooper, and and whatnot. We're starting to see that more and more people are starting to realize this is not how Peter Parker acts, and they keep telling if Dan Slott keeps writing the stories like this, then it's it should be logically only a matter of time before bing, it hits them. It's not Peter. You know, and uh, one thing I will give Humberto Ramos credit for is that he hasn't always drawn the best Mary Janes. He really hasn't. He's given her like the, the razor, the razor sharp chin thing going. But one thing I will give him credit for is that there's a there's a decent page here with with MJ on it. I don't know how well y'all can see it, but this is probably one of the best renditions of Mary Jane I've ever seen 
from Humberto Ramos. I, I really honestly can say that. Uh, but, yeah. And we also see an Ock in here considering being the superior Spider-Man practically 24-7. But we all know that ain't going to happen. But he, con he contemplates it. But the way this issue ends... God damn it! The way this issue ends... All I can say for old Philly boy, Hobby 2... <laughs> hey, Phil, that's your ass. <laughs> that is your ass. <laughs> wow, what an ending. This was a solid read. Loved it. Dan Slott just killing it here. Ramos' artwork is getting better for me. It's hit or miss sometimes, but it worked in here. Very, very well done. <sighs> Moving along. <laughs> Uncanny X-Men. Number nine. I hope y'all are still with me. I'm. This is like I said. This is a giant size review video. So hang in there. We're getting there. Brian Michael Bendis, Chris Bocciolo, still just nailing it. I gotta say, I fucking love that cover. I, I love this new look for Dazzler. She's now, you know, she's an agent of Shield, and we're oh god, we finally get what I was wanting to see when I knew Dazzler was coming into this series. A confrontation with Dick Summers. Yeah, he's still a dick. It's like... Uh, Bendis is... Uh, he's doing a fine job... Writing Dick Summers as a villain. You know, he's... Basically, Scott is... He's basically Magneto. He pretty much is. You know, he's proclaiming that he's doing what he can for the good of mutant kind. Yet he still has yet to actually answer for the crime of murdering Charles Xavier. Now whether you think Cyclops was right or not, that's irrelevant. The dude killed Xavier. And he still hasn't really honestly paid for it yet. And it's just... And the, the fact that Summers continues to try and justify his actions by saying he's doing it to be a martyr, to be the savior of mutant kind. Like, what the fuck ever? Uh, it's just, wow. The more I read Bendis' writing, the more I read from Bendis' writing, the more I'm starting to see just total arrogance from Cyclops in here. And the confrontation between him and, da and, him and uh, Dazzler here was just fantastic stuff. Good, good solid writing. Um... I mean, just good, solid writing, good artwork. I mean, Chris Bocciolo's artwork is just getting better and better. Uh, you know, not everybody likes it, but it is fantastic. But this particular issue ends on a da 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 kind of cliffhanger. Very nice. And I'm being joined here by this little guy. Yeah, this is Chester. Yeah, he decided to try and get in my room here. <laughs> that boy. <laughs> this is Chester. That's my boy. Go on, get out of here. <laughs> Alright, you want back up? Go on. Go on, get out of here. <laughs> Alright, sticking with Marvel. <laughs> sticking with Marvel, we got Venom number 38. Cullen Bunn. Still nailing in here. I mean, uh, interior artwork. Kim Jacinto. I hope I didn't butcher that name like I said. Uh, this is another one of those perfect examples on how a Venom series should be told. Keep it on the streets. You know, keep it simple. We don't need supernatural shit. Well, we get some supernatural shit in here with Jack-O-Lantern, but that's as much as we get. But... Keep it on the streets. Keep it where Venom can be at his best. He's tracking down Lord Ogre. We found out Lord Ogre's got a price on his head. And so we uh, Flash has learned, a, uh, learned an old trick from the symbiote. He can use the symbiote to disguise himself as basically any other person. He can disguise himself as an old lady, as a shorter person. He can 
he could change his appearance in almost any way. And I thought, okay, it's good that they touched on that because it's not the first time I've seen the symbiote do that to a host. But in here, I mean, it's just really good. And we also get hints, we also get uh, dialogue in here that suggests that Flash is now basically working on his own. He no longer has the support of the Avengers. He doesn't uh, have any more support from the government and everything. He's basically working on his own. So he's got this reporter here basically as his his uh, extra set of eyes and ears for when he needs to do his patrol work and everything. But what really sells this book is the action with Jack-O-Lantern. Ooh, it gets... Man... <sighs> I'll, I'll give credit to Marvel for, for this series on one thing. I mean, with Jack-O-Lantern, they took a, one of the most obscure characters that I've ever experienced, and they've made him badass. I mean, they've really, they've really made me love this villain, Jack-O-Lantern. And they kept this shit personal. This is great. I loved the cliffhanger at the end of the book. Just fantastic stuff. The interior artwork was good. The action was great. The writing was solid. This was a great issue for Venom. I'm just wondering, oh man, I can't wait to read the next issue because what we saw at the end of this book, it just piques my interest. What the fuck's gonna happen? This was good. Still on Marvel, <laughs> X-Factor, number 260, the end of X-Factor, this is part four of six, we're getting close, we're getting close to the finale, Peter David still hitting it here, this was another fun read from Peter David, it concerns uh, Lorna, the uh, Polaris, and Quicksilver, I mean the shit in here was so well done, I loved Polaris in this issue. She was funny. I love the stuff. She's just... <laughs> she's getting plastered in this issue. She's at a bar. She's tossing a few. She's drunk. I mean, she is drunk. And she's like, I'm part of X Factor. And the bar keeps like, what do you mean that game show with Simon Cow? Whatever. <laughs> oh boy. This was so good. This was just so well done. Peter David goodness at its best. It's it's more or less some of the same shit that I've been saying about X Factor for the past few years. Still solid, still fun. And I'm going to miss it like hell when it goes. I don't know if Marvel's... Now, as I'm filming this video right now, I don't know whether or not Marvel is actually going to relaunch this title. If they do, I don't think I'm going to get it. Because I really, honestly, don't see anybody else but Peter David writing this series. Writing these characters. I mean, it's just... I mean, Peter... Da I, this is Peter David's baby. If they cancel the series, it should not be relaunched. You should leave it as Peter David's baby. It's just fantastic goodness. Or as Ling Carr would say, awesome-tastic. We're finally ending Marvel. <laughs> no more Marvel, yay. <laughs> X-Men number three. Brian Wood. Oliver Capelli. Wow. The, next, uh, the continuation of the story involving Sublime and Arcane, or, uh, let me see if I got the name right. Archaea, excuse me, Archaea. Don't want to butcher it, because I don't want somebody trolling me saying, You got the name wrong, you got the goddamn name wrong, you bastard. <laughs> I sound like a bastard stepchild of Douchey McNitpick. Like, you got the goddamn thing wrong. Ah. <laughs> oh man, but this was this is still this is still very solid. I, in my opinion, in my honest opinion, I um, 
could have been just a, a little bit better, just a little bit. But for what we got in here, it was great. We're getting to see more and more good examples of Kitty Pride's leadership skills in here. Very well done. She's she and other members of the X Men or other students and mutants are helping cleaning up the mess at the Jean Grey School while Storm leads another team to go deal with Arkea and try and hopefully save uh, the Omega Sentinel, Karima. I mean, just awesome stuff. Um, Jubilee's uh, now going to be a full... I guess she's going to be a mommy in here now. But, I mean, the, the stuff in here was just fantastic stuff. I can't really honestly complain. Loved it. I mean, it's a simple... It, it, this was a simple issue of we got to go here and take care of this and they take care of it and now we're going back home that's pretty much what this was fantastic writing I love this cover with Betsy love me some Betsy Braddock Psylocke Rawr. yeah I, um, speaking of Betsy yeah I've I've heard that uh, Marvel's decided to make her um make her bisexual in the Uncanny X-Force series, but I don't read Uncanny X-Force, so I I don't know. I, okay, apparently now Psylocke is either, you know, gay or bisexual now. I don't really have a problem with it, you know, and if they flush that out, if they flush that character trait out of her more and more often saying other titles like this, I'm curious to see where they can go with it. But, um, yeah, this was a solid read. Really enjoyed it. Uh, the artwork was fantastic. The writing was good. Really can't complain. Wasn't perfect, but it was solid. We're done with Marvel. We're going to independent books here. We're going to start with Dynamite. The Spider, number 13. I know this has been out for a while now, but I am finally able to review it. David Liss, Ivan Rodriguez. I've now been reading a lot of Dynamite comics here lately thanks to my student, one of the best friends I've ever had in my life, the Mount Vernon kid, Chris. I thank you for that. Out of all the Dynamite series I've been reading, i got to say this is probably my favorite. I've been loving this. Don't get me wrong, Magic Wade's Green Hornet is still bitching, but... I'm loving me some spider. All oh, this was good. What a goddamn tease at the beginning of the story involving the law, the involving the law, the lawgiver. Oh, what a tease! You bastards! Oh, I loved it. <laughs> He's like, I, you know. I, Guess the spider feels like he could be more useful to him if he were alive. But I'm starting to feel like the lawgiver was just a scapegoat or a second banana or basically a bitch to the fly who is the main the big villain of the series. And man, this the fly. You want to talk about a seriously disturbed Douchebag, psychopathic son of a goddamn bitch! Wow! I guess that could perfectly sum it up. But more and more goodness in here is just, and um, get to see a, a father son chat between the spider and his dad in prison and everything. And I'm thinking this could lead somewhere in a big twist, but then something else happens, and you're and you read it, and you're going, "Holy shit! This is this is a gem. This is a gem from Dynamite Comics. Fantastic read. Loved it. I know I didn't get that much away in here, but I felt like it needed to be that way. I want to just." Praise the liver love and hell out of this series and make you want to get on board with it just like I did. F fucking phenomenal stuff. Love this. F fucking love this, man. <laughs> okay, next up. Okay, got the number. 
Montero, Witch of the Black Rose, number 81. Boobies! <laughs> Boobies. <laughs> okay, all joking aside, this was a fun read. Uh, they, they find um, now the Skeleton Man, Raven Hex, and you know, Taro's mother. Raven Hex is her sister, and there's also, they brought her mother with her, with them, and they find Taro. Taro is bewitched. She's, she's under a spell, she's being controlled, and they're trying their best to, you know, help her and everything. Um, but, but what's really good about this, this is probably, this was probably one of the more action-packed issues of the series in, a, in quite a while. Um, there's a there's a couple of pretty gruesome moments, and when you talk about gruesome moments from a, a series like this, think about gruesomeness, but drawn really really well by Jim Ballant kind of gruesome. You know, it's not John Romita Jr. gruesome; it's Jim Ballant gruesome. Just let that sink in for a minute, okay? Now I can't show you any pictures of what goes on. I I can't show you any of these moments because if I do. My account will go bye bye, because you know this is. Let's face it, this is a series known for big boobies and witchcraft. What more can a nerd like me ask for? But this was this was fun. This was fun. It was action packed, on like I said, on a Jim Balance scale. But I enjoyed it. It was great. Nice read. I'm happy I'm still on board with this. Terra Witch of the Black Rose, number 81. Pretty good. Very good. Boobies! <laughs> We're ending the review! The last book! Yes! Yes! Respect the beard! I'm rambling! Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles! Number 24! The next part of City Fall! Look at that badass cover with Splinter! That's awesome. Oh my god. This was good. This was really good. This was damn good. This was awesome. Bodacious. This was bitchin'. This was Bossa Nova. Chevy Nova? Whatever. This was really good. All joking aside. I mean, you want to talk about drama. You want to talk about serious, serious, high-level personal shit. Kevin Eastman, I, I, I love this stuff. I mean, we get the, the Turtles and Splinter get to meet the Shredder's new second-in-command. Leonardo. Leonardo works for the Shredder. Of course, we all we all saw how it happened in the last issue, but wow, the Turtles really have their buttons pushed in this issue. They have to go up against their brother. And of course, Splinter doesn't have the heart to fight his, his student, his son, Leonardo. And I mean, this was high drama, great action, solid writing, the artwork from uh, Met, uh, Matias Santiloco, I probably butchered that name and I apologize, but the interior artwork in here was very, very good. Uh, Kevin Eastman, Bobby Curdo, and Tom Waltz, they all did a great job with the script, with the writing, this was great. Uh, but. It, the, the, the book ends, it wasn't an ending on a cliffhanger, but it ended with a very sad moment for Master Splinter. This was great. I mean, if you're not on board with this particular run of the Turtles, then you're missing out on some real, real goodness. It's written by one of the people who created the Turtles, Kevin Eastman. But this has proven to be a very solid run so far. Still a very solid run. This was probably one of the most dramatic issues out of the entire series. And that's saying a lot. There has been loads of drama in this run of the Turtles. 
but seeing Leonardo working alongside the Shredder, it just, as a, as a hardcore Ninja Turtle fan, I have been a Ninja Turtle fan for most of my life, well over 25 years, and to see Leonardo working with the Shredder, it really hits me right there, and oh, that fucking hurt. <laughs> but it's just wow, just simply wow, the stuff Leonardo says in here, and the stuff he does I can't I can't say anymore I'm just gonna leave it at that and say get on board with this series put this on your pull list get on board with this series if you're a Turtles fan who hasn't jumped on board yet get as many back issues as you can get a fucking trade if you have to read these books they are great some of IDW's best shit right here. Without question. I am done! I am done with my giant size comeback. And I am tired. I want to thank y'all if you had the patience to stick it all the way through. If you skipped through a bunch of this video, I don't blame you. I ran my mouth off. I want to thank y'all for watching this. It's good to be back. I want to thank everybody who, I want to thank all of my friends, not just here on YouTube, but all, all my friends everywhere. And uh, I want to give a really, really big thank you to my family at Arkham Comics. Thank you for your patience with me, having to buy all this stuff. And I'm sure y'all are appreciating all my money. <laughs> but... Thank you to Arkham Comics, Ken, Sarah, love y'all, and especially my girlfriend, Jennifer. I love you, baby. Uh, I want to give a special shout out to all my friends at Dark Adventure Inc. Plus, Fast Stack of Comics, Mark and Chloe. There you go. Chris, my student, my brother, my friend. Love you, man. Uh, Deadpoolzilla, Brandon Hex, everybody. Everybody. Samantha on Tumblr. I love you, my friend. Ill Perrin. Love you too. It's just so good to be back. Until next time, everybody. I'll see you all later.